so take thank it. you for that. Gina, it's so nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, first been... time here, I mean, you could tell, right? I mean, like, first I'm so time happy to be here. Town. So proud to be here already, you know? <laughs> and um, I, I wrote down a whole list of things to talk to you about, but what I want to say first and foremost is, like we were talking about a second ago, in one of her more recent interviews, she was talking about wanting to push back against respectability politics. So this could go totally off the rails. <laughs> be ready, be ready, you've been warned. You know, there's a lot, you've been everywhere lately. I'm sure you guys read the New York Times article. How many of you have seen the TED Talk from 10 years ago? Everybody almost. Um, so there's, you know, the like, the interview version of Gina, the like the NPR CBS morning version. I want the like... <laughs> Which one? Tell me. I don't know. Smoking weed with your coworkers at the Done. Macy counter. Done. Jamming out to J Lo. Done. Yeah, there's a street girl in there. Yes. Yeah, that's I'm the Gina I'm you always, want to talk to. I'm always. Now I am. But I guess first, let's take it back to the very beginning. So also, by the way, this book just came out on Wednesday, and she's going to be signing copies for you guys later. <laughs> um, the very first sentence of the book. Uh, I learned how to be trans in the Catholic Church. So as a half Thai gay boy, my mother was Buddhist. Mm -hmm. I was baptized Catholic. Everybody in the room, I'm sure, is familiar with the Catholic Church. <laughs> heard of it, heard of it. So like that line, it caught me right away. So can you talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in such a strict religious environment in the Philippines? Ooh. Um... But also being you, because <laughs> you were always being you. Being me, I'm always me. Um, okay, so Philippines, uh, obviously, you know, in, in this conversation, sometimes I would be um, addressing, obviously, Philippine context, Western context, because I have lived half of my life in the Philippines, half here, so my perspective is global. So very, very different culture. Um, when I said on that very first line of the book, I learned how to be trans in the Catholic Church. Because in the Philippines, there's a very symbiotic relationship between transness and Catholicism. So actually, obviously we're now in June, but during the month of May in the Philippines, it's actually peak Catholic fiesta celebration, meaning we have Catholic fiestas all over the Philippines, always celebrating you know, uh, Catholic pat patrons, saints, all over the Philippines, right? So we have, whether it's like a five-day party, that happens throughout the Philippines. And during those celebrations, um, usually it's a five-day celebration. Um, on the fifth day, on the main event in the Philippines, that, you, that usually falls on a Sunday, the main event for the whole family to watch, for the whole family to see, is a transgender beauty pageant. And usually if it's in the neighborhood pageant, like right there on the street, right here, you could imagine there's a church, it's usually the stage is right in front of the church. And most of these pageants are actually organized by the government. Just like Nashville. <laughs> Very much so, yeah, that we could relate. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's that, there's that symbiotic relationship, but I, I see, you know, the head, you know, in agreement, fascination, from a Western context, especially when, when, when I speak about this, people would initially would think, oh, you mean it's accepted because it's part of this mainstream culture and also fascinated, right? You wanna ask more questions. I'd like to say that um, it's a, there's a long history, uh, there's so many forces that led to that. Um, because in the Philippines, Pre-colonized Philippines, we've had a long history of gender fluidity in our culture. We don't even have he or she in our language. It's a gender neutral language. Tagalog, our main dialect, main language. We have hundred something dialect. We don't have he or she. Um, get me drunk later, maybe I'll call you he or she. Where I always <laughs> will get confused. Not with intention, but joking aside, I like to, I like to think that's my ancestors telling me we've always known mm -hmm. that gender is just not, not this Western idea of gender binary. Right. So 
so we have that long history of gender fluidity in our culture. Trans people has been well documented, um, played a very crucial role in society in the Philippines. We are the advisors to our kings and queens, and we have so many kingdoms in the Philippines. We have 7,000 islands. So before we were colonized, we have so much of that. So there's a lot of trans people that played a crucial role. We're the spiritual leaders, right? And then 1521 happened, Ferdinand Magellan got to the Philippines. And for the next 333 years, we were a Spanish colony. Thus, the introduction of Catholic you know, religion, Catholic calendar of that fiesta celebration. And then in 1898, you know, we were purchased by America for $20 million from Spain. Wow. So, and we were quite a bargain. That's a know. deal. <laughs> you can't get a two I don't know who, here for I that. I don't know who's in that negotiation table. I would be like... Well, first, I won't be in that negotiation table. <laughs> um, and then for 50 years, we were an American you know, uh, a colony. And um, that's, the, that's in, in around 1919, as a form of friendship, America brought this thing called Carnival Queen, which is this pageant where they pick you know, a, this, a woman that would be the ambassador. That's why we have that formula of the pageant, mm -hmm. right? You combine all that forces, the amalgamation of all that, and then you have a transgender beauty pageant that is so vibrant, that happens throughout the country. Our trans beauty pageants are shown on national television in the Philippines on a Sunday. After everybody goes to church on the mass, we go home at 1 p.m., the whole family eating lunch, babies, everybody watching trans beauty pageant. Right, it's, 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 it's. Like what football is here. Exactly. Like the whole family around is, the TV. It is yeah. very much. That's how, I mean, it is considered a national sport in the Philippines, transgender beauty pageants. It is the, it's so vibrant. It's so, it's so ingrained in our, in, in our culture. And you, for a long time, were the Tom Brady <laughs> of the Philippines transgender what? beauty pageants. Say that again. What? I didn't you, hear you. You, I, you ran this that shit, This is not shit, working. I can't, I can't hear you. What? You ran yeah. that shit. You were running it. Like, yes. as a teenager. But before that, I want to talk just for a second. Yeah. When you were 12, your mother moved to America mm -hmm. to be with the rest of her family. And your family was split up a little bit. And she was already really supportive of you. Mm -hmm. Like you, like me, you were like a mama's boy when you were little, mama's girl. I was, girl. I was. And so like, I know that's young, but like, what, what's your strongest memory from that time? Like her leaving, being supportive of who you are, but like having your number one fan kind of have to leave. I was having a conversation with somebody about this. You know, when I when I when I sleep, I sleep on my side. I like a huggy pillow. Um, when my mom left, as a form of um, she she gave me and my sister a hot dog huggy pillow, so that she she told she told us this this will be me, so that when I leave, you'll always have me. Mine was Ninja Turtle, you know, <laughs> color red. But I somehow I still think, is it related to that? You know, so that's the that's that's one thing that uh, that I think that I could think of of the memory of of the closeness that I have with my mom and that huggy pillow that she she gave me. And and still to this day, I'm I'm trying to figure this out. Maybe I'm a therapist here, maybe. You know, like I sleep on my side. I need to have a something huggy pillow to, and some, something to hug. Uh, so maybe I'm still trying to figure that out. So that's that. That's one. But more so, you know, I'm just so fucking blessed to have that. You know, this is a very devout Catholic woman who loves her trans daughter. Right. And... She came with me when I had my surgery in Thailand. Um, we had an amazing time together. It's almost like a road trip thing that we did. Um, but I can't question her Bible. You know, she'll hang up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot question about anything decolonizing with her. Right. So even that is a complicated thing. So my memory of that is... It's obviously a sense of loss, a sense of my biggest support um, that whether obviously she knows it or not, but she just allowed me to be. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, I detailed in the book, um, I remember distinctly when 
there was a moment when I was around, you know, five, six years old, and I would always wear a t-shirt on, you know, my head and would always parade in our neighborhood with that. Or if I really feeling myself, I would like wrap the whole long blanket and feeling like it's really my long hair. Mm -hmm do it all the time, and you know, when she asked me, it's like, why do you always do that? It's my hair, mom, I'm a girl, you know? For her to just acknowledge that, um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine a life without that, without that love and acknowledgement, so. And like probably everybody in this room, you also found you know, the family that we choose, like there's the family you're born into, there's the family that we choose, and you found the Garcia clan. Yes. Who took you under their wing, <laughs> and made, like, propped you up and made you, I mean, they were like, this is the one. You were like Simba in The Lion King. They were like, she's the one that's going to win everything. And I did, I did. I did and I then did. she did. I mean, it's more actually more they found me mm -hmm. because uh, when I was 15 years old, this woman named Tiger Lily, I'm still in touch with her. She's, she, so we'll get to this, but she, she did my, the, the font of my book is um, this is the handwriting of my trans mom. So the woman that gave me the name Horace Barbie, I was like, when we were doing the, the, book, the book covers, like she has to be part of this, because she does calligraphy. Right. So when I was 15, I was still in high school, senior high school. We don't have middle school in the Philippines, so you graduate 16, but I graduated 15 because you know I went to school early. <laughs> I don't know why that happened. Uh, um, I, I, w I was in uh, school, college of St. Peter, you know, with short hair, and I'm, uh, a friend of a friend told me that like, there's this group of people that's coming into town. They're famous and they're known, they're icons in our community because particularly this woman named Tiger Lily, she was the beauty queen maker. Like th those uh, trans beauty pageants that I was watching on, on, on TV, I would just be in awe of them, you know, like looking at them, it's like, you know, Every young trans femme in the Philippines, trans Filipina, wants to be part of that beauty pageant culture. But like, you have no fucking idea if you could really do that. I'm like, I don't know how you do that. And then she introduced me to. They they went to college together, and I remember the first time meeting together. She just like, I was still in my high school uniform, and she told me like, take off take off that uniform, put on this bikini. She had this bikini because they were joining a pageant. Put on this bikini. I was like, mm, what am I doing? Like, she's this icon. I put on that bikini. I just, I walked for her. I performed in front of her. And she was just like, you're joining a pageant. You, you're, you're doing this. And to be asked that, you know, at 15, mm -hmm. with the woman who is like the beauty queen maker in the Philippines, of course you fucking join the pageant when she tells you to join a pageant. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that pageant was like two days later. Or like... About a week later. A week, like... Instantly, almost though, it's like you try on a bikini for the first time, and less than a week later, you're in a beauty pageant. Yeah, because I, at the time I was living in a suburb outside the Philippines, outside Manila, the capital, and she told me there's this big pageant. This is like the pageant. Um, we call it like the veterans pageant, meaning like this is like the top of the top of their field. Beauty queens, trans beauty queens, they're joining at this pageant in the city. So after school, I was, you know, in my backpack. I had to ask my dad for like uh, money for the bus to get to the min <laughs> to get to the city. I got there, you know, I did the pageant. It was a street pageant. There's about 48 candidates of like the top of the top of their field. My very first pageant, I ended up winning Bess in swimsuit. <laughs> Bass in long gown and second runner up. Wow. Yeah, I made quite a big of a fucking splash. Those old heads were mad, weren't they? Yeah, they were like, what who I, I literally came <laughs> out of fucking nowhere. And like, I mean, like I and this is so crazy as well because I, just a week uh, or like two weeks be prior to that, it was the finals of our, their biggest trans beauty pageant on national t TV called Super Sirena, which is like Super Mermaid, right? That's what it means. So two weeks prior to that, I was just watching the finals of this pageant where the whole, everybody was there, right, on, the, on, on TV. I was gawking. And then two weeks later, I was in the same competition with them and beat all of them. You know? so, <laughs> 
I mean, I don't know what happened there. I remember going back to the going, I didn't even sleep. I was like full of like adrenaline. I went to, I went to class the next day wearing my sash and my classmates like, what is that? And it's like, yeah, I did this thing and they couldn't believe it. And I couldn't believe it. I love that you wore it to school the next day. I did. I know, I mean, 15 year old adrenaline, you just became like the one in the, in the scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. Adrenaline, energy, all of that magic. And you could have stayed and enjoyed that like level of celebrity and success and financial security, but your mom called and said, you have a green card if you want it. Yeah. Um, God. Um, at, you know, from 15 to 17, I, I did that. I, I was like, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And after high school, I was like, I'm gonna be a, a, a trans beauty queen. That became my career. I became the pageant diva. I was making so much money. I was making 15 times the national average. Making a lot of money. As a kid. As, yeah, 15, I was able to you know, help out my mom you know, uh, for, to provide myself, pay for my own hormones, pay for everything. And I, was, I have a lot of boyfriends all over the Philippines. I was traveling around, you know. I was a diva in all aspects of life, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> in all pleasures of life. And um, at 17, um, I mean, again, going back to the pageant, we were at the back of a bus, mountain switchback, 4 a.m., purple lit bus. I got a phone call from my mom from my very expensive Nokia phone, <laughs> 8810. Remember the small Nokia yeah. phone, 8810? It was the most expensive in the Philippines. I had it, you know. <laughs> I had it. I'm the only one who had it in my group because <laughs> I was the one always winning. So yeah, my mom called me. She's like, your green card petition came through. You should now move to the U.S. And I remember saying to my mom, I didn't want to move to the U.S. And you could just imagine, I, I could just imagine. And it wasn't that. even as bad then as it is now here. <laughs> it's way worse now. If only I knew this is where we'll be. You know what? You know what? Let, 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 let me go back to the Philippines. Um, yeah, I said no to my mom. I didn't want to move to the U.S. because I was a pageant diva. I was, you know, 17 years old. I, ha I was the shit. You know, mm -hmm. why would I leave that? Right. And then two weeks later, my mom called me. She was living in San Francisco. And she said that, but you know, if you move to California, you could change your name and gender marker here. You could be legally recognized as a woman here. I was like, what? I mean, to be, to see F on my document, mm -hmm. it was like she's speaking magic. Because to this day, in the Philippines, there's no gender recognition policy. To this day, if I reclaim my Philippine citizenship on my passport, it will be M. I, I won't be able to feel affirmed in all of my documents. So when she said that, I was like, forget pageants. I'm moving to America. I'm going to have F on my document. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I did, you know. And I think it's important to put context here because I know I've been speaking about this very mainstream visibility of trans people in the Philippines. In the Philippines, trans people are culturally visible, right? We're part of mainstream society, mm -hmm. but we're not politically recognized. There are no rights for trans people in the Philippines to this day. There are no anti-discrimination protection, there are no obviously gender recognition policy. It's still very much DIY right now. It's not something I advocate, but it's very much a DIY when it comes to like hormone replacement therapy. It's right. still intra-community knowledge. Right. I mean, there are changes, but it's still very much like that. We have to survive and we do it. Um, so when I moved to America in 2001, it was a 17 year old you know, trans Filipino immigrant. It was the other way around, right? I was politically recognized, mm -hmm. F on my gender marker, but there was no culture of visibility of trans people. Right. So it was like this, I mean, I asked my mom, where are the trans pageants? Like, what are you talking about? There are no <laughs> pageants like that here in America, you know? And um, it, it, brought, it's, it brought so much confusion because I see the F on my document, I couldn't feel like there's a limit on my expression, and the, I think that this is a pivotal moment for me. I mean, obviously now writing this book, looking back to it, um, but certainly the feeling that I felt 
in this moment when the very first trans representation that I saw on national television. You know, that's the thing I was looking for because we were on TV, you know, we're, we're very visible. I couldn't be visible. I couldn't find it. The first trans representation I saw on TV was Jerry Springer. I feel like that might be true for a lot of us. Yeah. Well, like I'm trying to think. I'm like, what, what was there here before that? Yeah. You know? So I was shocked when I saw that. I was really shocked that, oh, fuck, this country it sees me this way, you know? That I am a pariah. I'm a, a circus, you know, something to be ashamed of, you mm -hmm. know? And even not just seeing it as is, but just the way it's done. You know, like how, I mean, he recently passed. Um, the fact that his show was on until like, it was just canceled like five years ago. Right. The fact that it stayed on for that long says a lot in American culture. It says a lot how American sees gender yeah. and the understanding of it. It's through that lens, right? right? But even that, the way it was done was like buttering up someone and then, you know, r rallying up the audience and then drop. Right. The, the shock and surprise of this is something to be ashamed of. So I was ashamed. That was the beginning of, oh, this is really a different freaking culture. It took America to introduce you to sh That's what we specialize in here. <laughs> Shame, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but at least when you first got here, you were in the San Francisco area where yes. there was like a nice Filipino trans community. Yes. You had like coworkers and friends and you I were kikiing did. at work. I, I was, I, so I started working in Macy's Cosmetics um, with no background in cosmetics, I think. When you read the book, you'll see a lot of like finagling my way into something. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know how to apply makeup. I show up in beauty pageants, I sit down, and I get taken care of, you know. But my friend was like, "Just do it. Just, just we'll go to my grandma's salon, and you'll get your makeup done. You lie, and then you said you did your own makeup." Right. They never found out. I obviously I got the job. So <laughs> lying to get a job in America, hmm, it works here. I think it worked. You know. Do it, do it, do it, <laughs> do it, try it once. We've all done it, come on. Uh, anyway, so, and I felt like that was, and when I met this tr uh, trans community in San Francisco working in cosmetics, it's almost like pageant adjacent. There's almost one trans Filipino in every single beauty pageant, uh, beauty counter, beauty makeup, what am I talking about? Beauty cosmetics counter. That's pageant adjacent, I right. felt, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found them, and I have my new community. And so, how long were you in San Francisco before you decided to go to New York? I was there for four years, yeah. During which time? During which time? In 2003, there okay. was a very important birthday. A birthday. Yeah. My vagina birthday. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She is 20 years old, you guys. <laughs> She's almost legal to drink, but we won't tell my mom. She's Alice, been drinking. Is there any tequila here? We won't tell. <laughs> is that ever going to happen here or no? Uh, <laughs> I heard that's what she drinks. That drank. would be the first. That would be the first. Um, um, 2003, I went to Thailand with my mom. I went to... Um, this is so freaking hilarious. Um, I was at a book party last night, and this guy had a Maserati uh, hat, and I kept on saying, Maserati, Maserati, because I actually describe in the book, and this is how he was actually called, this surgeon in Thailand, amazing surgeon. And this is not even, this is not even in Bangkok. This is like in a suburb in Thailand, two hours south of Thailand, in Chonburi, um, where nobody, at the time, barely anybody spoke English. So you could imagine me and my mom trying to get by. I mean, the doctor spoke English, I, I think. <laughs> I mean, I communicated what I wanted, so I guess he was. <laughs> I understood what I wanted. So, yeah, he's described as the Maserati of vaginas. <laughs> Figure that out. So, and I think 20 years in, I'm still happy, so. Happy 20th birthday. Yeah. <laughs> my mom, if you follow me on IG, my mom, every July 8th, that's my vagina birthday, I celebrate it. I have two birthdays, obviously. My mom sings to me, happy birthday, vagina, in Tagalog. <laughs> but that. not just vagina, but like the slang. Remind me to show you later. The slang. It's like happy, maligayang, bati, pukengkeng. Pukengkeng is 
the slang in Tagalog. So. <laughs> yeah, that's how my mom is. So, yeah. Right, July eighth. When July is 8th. when is your birthday though? October twenty first. Okay. Libra. Libra. The, yes. Something Libra. The very end of Libra, I think, right? What does it mean? I don't know. I've been asked about it. What does that mean? I'm married to a Libra. Okay. And I'm a Gemini, so it's like supposedly the Libras balance out the two halves of the Gemini. <laughs> I don't know. Me balance? I don't know. <laughs> Who invented that thing? You know, I don't know. They I... just make that kind of shit up. Okay, sure. <laughs> so um, what about New York? After you left San Francisco, you moved to New York. God, New York, New York. Um, I moved to New York 2005. Mm -hmm. Oh, it just gave me goosebumps. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. That was Somewhere a good time here. to be it's there. It's the Libra, maybe, thing. Telling me, like, girl, <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's balance, you know. Very, very different time. Um, you know, I, just to, with Sam, when I was living in San Francisco, I, I've forgotten, you know, that, that career that I had in the Philippines. I was just like, maybe, okay, I'm good with this. I'm in cosmetics. Maybe I'll go to college. I took some classes in psychology. I don't know what I was thinking, but I'm trying to figure out, I guess, my process, assimilation, <laughs> I don't know, all that, all that thing. And then I met a model who told me, in, I met a model in San Francisco, and she told me, like, if you really want to do it, you have to move to New York City. So in 2005, with no idea how to, like, really get into modeling industry, um, I moved to New York City. Obviously, very different time. When I moved to New York, I made a very conscious decision to be stealth, meaning my model agent did not know I was trans. The fashion industry did not know I was trans for eight years. So you're literally going from being one of the most famous trans people in the world to pushing yourself entirely back into the closet. Yeah. And doing everything you can to pass as a cis woman. Yes. It's, um, you know, I was out and proud in Asia, and this promise of America, of freedom, when I moved to New York, freedom where? Freedom to who? Certainly not for a trans woman, right? And that kind of internalized repression in the deeper sense, in the most strict sense, was... I mean, this, in a way, also, this book was like my process of, of looking back into it, because it was survival mode for me. You know, at the time, I mean, this is 2005, and also you would think fashion is like artistic, you know, art pretty industry, pretty, all that stuff, but like, no. The fashion industry is littered with stories of trans women, and I, I owe so much to so many of these women, like Carol, Caroline Cosey, Tracy Africa Norman, the first black uh, trans uh, model that, that you know, became famous in the 70s, to Lauren Foster, to Crimsona Case, and so many more names. It, there, it's littered with stories of trans women, particularly fashion models, that the moment they got outed, by the press, by tabloids. It's a format by the tabloid, and usually by someone they know. Mm. Either their stories were sold, or it's just like off the cuff, like, you know. Their careers disappeared like that, like thrown into trash. So in as much as these women created this sense of possibility for me, there were also a sense of caution. Right. Like, maybe I could do what they're doing, but I don't want what happened to them to happen to me. So, for eight years, you know, yes, I was, I was no. <laughs> uh, for eight years, I was living that life of fashion model, it's, um, I was, I was so, the memory of, of being this vibrant uh, trans beauty pageant girl in the Philippines to, to repression in New York City as a fashion model. And it's so f freaking weird because you were in this industry that is so visible. Mm -hmm. I was also consciously invisible at the same time. Like fighting to make yourself invisible. I, I, I did, I mean, now I look back and I, I'm joking about this now but certainly 
one could just imagine what what was happening in my head and the, the paranoia and yeah. the emotional anguish, the psychological anguish to get through that, get to the next day of having to hide, having to edit everything that I say. Like, I would never be speaking like this at the time for eight years. I'll be speaking like, I know, like, totally. <laughs> it's so fucking stupid, you know? And I would go to... Um, um, uh, we would call it cattle call casting, yeah, where like you're a bunch of like 500 whatever models waiting, waiting around to be called. And in my backpack, I have, you know, a, a pack of tampons so that when I'm in a bathroom and another model asks, like, do you have a tampon? Yes, girl, yeah. Right. Shit like that. Or I became this, no, I was becoming this girl that like, I think people were, you know, trying to like, she always have like something in her neck, you know, like a problem because. In fashion shoots, sometimes when they would put like um, curlers in the head, you know, on your hair, and then when you take it out, and usually the hairstylist would want to put the hair down, and they put the hairspray, and they really want you to put your hair all your uh, head all the way back, mm -hmm. right? So that it creates volume and everything. But even that very particular move was a point of fear and possible ruin my career. So every time a hairstylist would ask me to do that, I wouldn't do all the way at the back. I would go to the side because I was afraid my Adam's apple might show up. Shit like that. Like every minute of every work day. The thing I was saying about like making fun of, like I now know why I love spy genres because I felt like I was in a clandestine operation for eight years. Right. I mean, I really love, I, I definitely, I'm really, I mean, we could talk about spy genres, and I will judge you what kind of spy movies or series that you like, because I've seen the best one, let me just say that. So, but I do really felt like, you know, I was, now, I, now it makes sense, because I was in a clandestine operation. I have to be vigilant, I have to protect the cover, in all aspects of my life. Um, Were there people that you could trust? Yeah, thank God I have this one trans-Filipina friend, um, that truly knew everything, but besides that, I, I couldn't. I yeah, I would. I was also a twenty-one year old young model who just had the most amazing Maserati. Remember Maserati? <laughs> of course, I was also having fun, right? right? I was also having fun. I was sleeping around. You know, I was a twenty-one year old. It was also like the the peak of like club scene in New York City and Twenty Seventh Street. I mean, some of you were there. Yeah, we're, we were all there. We were all there. I mean, Bungalow A, Kane, all of that. You know, we've all seen it. So. Um, so you're also like discovering personal physical pleasure in a way that you hadn't known before? Internally, but also with limits, because even moments of potential partner with someone, mm -hmm. oh fuck, no, I can't do this, you know, because if he says something, if I open up, all those stories would come back to me of trans women that got outed by someone they know. Right. So. Yes, I was having fun for one night, and then bye, see you later. But that's the limit of what I could do. I mean, I couldn't really fully open up. Um, I was always calculating. I was always editing. Mm -hmm. I was always trying to figure out, I meet you. Where do you fit in this circle, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you fit? What kind of story I tell you? Like a spy. Like a spy. Man, for 10 years almost. Yeah, and what years. was the breaking point? Like, what got you to where you were like, I cannot do this anymore? There are many, 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 many things um, that led to that. But I think um, one one moment I remember, I I did this commercial. That the first inkling of I, I can't continue living like this because this is quite. Ins it, re I'm re recognizing how insane this is. Why did I choose that? Anyway, I was there. I did this uh, commercial for uh, Rimmel Cosmetics. It's a lip gloss commercial. And you know, at the time, I mean, still is, but certainly at the time, if you do a cosmetic contract or a cosmetic commercial as a model, it's the peak. You, you've done it. You've, that, was, that was what you want. So I did that commercial and I remember, you know, looking at the, you know, the, the cab, the, the television and the cab, like looking at it, and I remember feeling that holy fucking shit, like people would know, people would see. Mm -hmm. 
a moment that should have been a celebration. I was at home with my best friend, Erica, who's a trans Filipina, freaking the fuck out. Like, literally waiting that that phone call would ring. My agent would say, hey, Gina, New York Post calls that you're a man. It's like, the, you know, you want to achieve bigger things, but the bigger the job, the bigger the paranoia. Right. I don't know why I got myself into this, but like, anyway. <laughs> and one of those instances was that John Legend music video. Yes. Where you were like, fuck. Like, if I get called into the dressing room, am I going to get fired? You know, you're flipping your hair. Well, back that's like actually my scene. very first job. And that was one of my first big job. And so that was my introduction to like, I, I don't know why I got myself into this, but I guess I'm here now. I did this music video with John Legend, this is 2005, he was just, this was his first album, you know, and that album got, you know, won the Grammy for R&B album, I don't know why, but you know, maybe, <laughs> it's sprinkled some magic maybe or something, <laughs> but this is um, this, this song called Number One, and it's so crazy, and you could watch this, watch this now on YouTube, I, I posted my specific clip on my IG, I mean, talking about who could have fucking figured this out? Because, I mean, there are other girls uh, in the music video, but in my section of my music, uh, you know, when he was singing to me, I was, my scene was I was behind the curtain. You see my silhouette, you know, and he was singing to me. I eventually showed up and, you know, you know, sort of like, you know, come hither, come here, you know, look at me. I'm this gorgeous model. And there was even a scene in, in that music video where I was about to, I, w I flipped my, uh, my head, um, you know, for the hair flip. And I was thinking, okay, go big or go home. I guess we're going to do this. Maybe, maybe because I'm, you know, I was backlit the shadow, they might not see the Adam's apple. But I was worried about that. But as he was singing to me in my part, he was singing, the lyrics was, now who is she? What's her name? You don't need to know about everything. This book has a lot of freaking crazy coincidences. <laughs> so I, I, mean, I, I don't know who did that. But yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. And then to get to the point of like the big, the big moment of anguish that led me to um, that decision and Taryn here, I think is my friend here and I haven't seen in a while is also very much aware of that journey. Uh, we, this was around uh, 2013 on my 30th birthday. Um, as I'm entering you know, my new decade in my life, I felt like you know, looking into like, okay, I'm turning 30, what does it mean? I cannot continue living like this. And I think uh, a year before that, I was really, thinking so much of like, am I ever gonna come out? Am I ever gonna be allowed to just say that word trans without shame? And I think, I've been thinking so much of that, that the stress of, of is there a napkin somewhere? Is, um, the stress of, of wanting to, to speak truth into existence was getting too much and I had a crazy, I mean, I've always had eczema, but that year, that moment, I was about to turn 30, the eczema was crazy that uh, my dermatologist stopped for a minute that I had scabies. It's so nuts. It was all over my body. It was in my scalp. It was, um, there's still some marks. So I, it got to the point I never thought I'll be able to wear a swimsuit again. It was that bad. Um, and then it took a, a woman, uh, and, and they gave everybody, they gave everything to me, like steroids, injections. They gave, thank you. They gave, um, they gave steroids. They gave everything. And it took a woman um, dermatologist to ask me the question, and she said, "What the hell is going on? Mm. What what is? You need to check in really internally. What's going on?" The moment she said that, I knew exactly what she was talking about. I didn't need to say like, oh, I need to come out, you know? But I knew exactly what she was talking about. And I write in the book, I was just like, I just need to honor this eczema. <laughs> I need to honor the eczema. <laughs> it's honoring the eczema. And then I, you know, my partner and I, um, and literally right after that, 
I said, okay, let me, let me go back to what I know, which is I started doing intense yoga, clean eating, Intense yoga, like hot vinyasa, that I, I, there are many moments in, in, in that, even in just that two-week span of, I felt sense of peace that I would come home from a, a hot vinyasa yoga crying because I felt that sense of peace for whatever the journey I was going through in that moment. And then my partner said, let's go to Tulum and, and, and celebrate your 30th birthday. And so we were there. We were, we were at an artist residency. We went there. We knew some people. And then, you know, closer to my 30th birthday celebration, we, we were dancing salsa on the beach, uh, live band, drinking a lot of margarita. And so my partner asked me, so gee, what, what does turning 30 to you, what does it mean? And somehow, because I've been thinking about it and for the first time to say it out loud, like it's in my head, that's why it's trying to come out with that eczema, but to say it out loud for the very first time, I said, I said to him, love, I'm ready to come out and tell my story and my 30th birthday. The moment I said it, the live band, there's a singer, stop the music, right? And I was like, what the fuck's going on? They stopped the music. I'm like, is it from only one? Oh no, I'm like, that was not planned. They stopped the music, and then the guy said something in Spanish, and next thing we knew, hundreds of sea turtles were being born under our feet. I have the, I have the tattoo here to commemorate that. It's so freaking, at the time I didn't know. I was just like, oh my God, it's eternal. <laughs> I have pictures, I have pictures. Like, you know, I, I started, you know, taking the, the sea turtles to guiding them to the ocean because apparently, the, you know, when sea turtles are born, they respond to the vibration mm -hmm. of the waves. So they, that's why they go there. But because there was a live band salsa and people were dancing, they got, they thought, the vibration was going there, leading to us, right? So after taking the sea turtles, you know, uh, back to the ocean, <laughs> looking at the dance floor, I was like, what the fuck just happened? And, I, and it was like, I obviously started crying like crazy. And, but literally the next day, it was as if night and day. I was, there was, there was a sense of drive, there was a sense of clarity, there was a sense, obviously, nature speaking to that. I may have not articulated it in that way, but certainly I, w I felt that sense of change mm -hmm. in me. And quite literally the next day, I started calling our, some of our mutual friends uh, from the community, how I met Taryn, Summit Series. Um, I just went from being so afraid and then the sea turtles guiding me, and I went unapologetic. And I was like, if I'm going to risk telling my story to come out, which 2013, I, I still obviously consider it as a risk, let me do it in the biggest possible stage ever. So let me give a TED Talk and come out on a TED Talk. <laughs> Something simple, you know? Small. Who, who's never done a public speech? I, yes, I've done pageants, but like, let me, let me do it in the biggest possible way. Let's go big or go home. And, you know, I called a friend named Cameron Sinclair, who has won a TED Prize, and I shared to him. I obviously came out to him, and I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll support this. You're my friend. <laughs> and he shared my story to uh, the TED people, and then you know, I, I, a few weeks later, I got a phone call that like, yeah, we want to do this, you know. But that, there was, were the, that was like the first transgender topic, TED Talk. On, on the main stage. Yeah. yeah, on the main, main stage. And I mean, why, right? But whatever. Yeah, I mean, 2014. I mean, little did I know what would have happened in 2014. I think if you were aware of what was happening at the time, it's, I mean... It's, there, there was a cultural wave of, you know, cultural zeitgeist of that conversation about, you know, transgender identity. Um, Amazon's um, Transparent came out, Netflix Orange is New Black came out. Mm -hmm. I did my TED Talk in March, and then Laverne Cox um, Time Magazine came out June that year. I mean, little did I know, I was, you know, part of that wave, riding that wave of visibility. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I mean, do you, you <laughs> right? And did you have that conscious feeling where it's like, fuck it, like I could be 
ruining my whole career. Like I could be fucking up my whole life, but I have to do this no matter what. I think I got to the point where, as I mentioned, uh, th th really that sense of feeling, I, I, I completely being honest, I don't know, I, I art articulated like, oh my God, I'm going to do that. It's just that feeling that this is, it's like that sense of purpose was so much bigger than any fear that right. I could imagine, you know? And I, I, I'll go big or go home. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember being so freaking excited and doing that. I forgot to tell my model agent what I'm about to do. <laughs> imagine that phone call. <laughs> I mean, there were many strategizing how am I going to deliver this news to my model agent slash business partner. And I was like, am I going to write poem? Am I going <laughs> to? Oh, I did consider that. I, I, am I going to send flowers and then just like have that letter? I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to make that phone call. So I called him. I said, Ron, I'm doing a TED Talk. I'm going to come out. And he said, coming out as a lesbian. I am so proud of you. <laughs> He really did say that. <laughs> and then it's like, no, actually, um, I'm coming out as a trans woman. It was the longest three seconds of my life. Oh my God. I was like, what is he going to say? Thank fucking God. He said, you know what? I commend you. I commend your bravery to do this. We might gain clients. We might lose clients. <laughs> we'll see. Well, probably those catalog clients in the South, no more, you know, but maybe we'll figure something out, you know? Because I was also doing a lot of catalogs, which is big money making stuff as well. Not the most common, but it's, we love it. We love it. You know? Did you anticipate having to become the face of something, like an ambassador for a movement? Because I think that's the hard part for a lot of people. Like you do it for your own spirituality and the, well, the wellness of your own soul. And then people are like, well, you're up there, and now you're the face of this. I think I, I had some idea that potentially th that would happen because of you know the how momentous that was, especially you know at, at the TED stage at that caliber of of you know public speaking. So I was aware of that, and I got ready. I have you know a friend, um, Ali Hoffman, who helped me out. It's like if we're going to do this, if we want to continue this conversation. Let's you know create this advocacy campaign. So I knew going into it um, that that's what we might be doing, but I didn't know right away of the, how, how much it resonated, you know, to, you know, because the, the response from people was great. It went viral, that talk went viral. And um, yeah, next thing I knew from TED Talk, from Sea Turtles, Realization, TED Talk, to speaking at the UN, you know, the biggest stage, a very respectable spaces. And um, I, I, I've said this before, but I really felt like I was having an Angelina Jolie moment, you know, like switch of career, look at me with my chic dress. UN ambassador. Their UN ambassador, Ferragamo dresses, you know, very minimalist and speaking so, you know, whatever, elegance, whatever that. And I did, and I did that, you know, and... But at the time, I knew there was a sense of purpose in doing that, too, right. because I, I knew how much it resonated to people that, okay, this woman has a global story. It resonates with what UN is doing. Next thing I knew, President Obama's State Department called and said, we want to send you places and you know, advocate for these policies that we support. And I did that, USAID to UNDP. And I was traveling. I was doing that. Mm -hmm. And... It was powerful, it was important, there was a sense of purpose, there was also a, a sense of uh, patriotic duty in, in doing that. Uh, and I'm sure it felt then that it was going in the right direction. Like you're part of a movement, you're getting to go to these places and do these things, and oh, the world's changing for the better. It, it very much felt like that. Personally, after about two years of doing that, I got fucking exhausted. Yeah. I was like, I think that the, the ego part in me, you know, it, maybe at the beginning felt like, look at me trailblazing. I'm the only one in the room, you know, powerful, <laughs> you know, older right. white men at the UN, you know, right. powerful. They're listening to me. Right. I think after a few years of doing that, I was like, girl. I just want to be in Playboy. 
that, I, that's, you know, I'm an artist, you know, I, I just, I want to fuck shit up, you know, mm. I want to like, you know, get in trouble. And, right. But more so, I felt like I was beginning to question why am I the only one in the room? Mm -hmm. And I began to question what is the, what is the system that, that made this thing to be, mm -hmm. to be the only one in the room. And then, then I went from wanting to be Angelina Jolie to I want to be like Tyra Banks, you know, create a production company with no background in producing. And I did, you know, mm -hmm. and I did because I wanted to tell more stories. I want to create more stories. I want to produce. I want to, you know, I'm an artist and, and I think that's a, that's a platform that I could do. And, and once I started doing that, I think people saw the, 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 the changes on that of, you know, oh, this, this is offering something different here. And then next thing I knew, I got a DM from Playboy <laughs> to say that you will be the first trans API Playboy Playmate. You want to do it? Of course I want to do it. How could you say no to that? Why would you say no? <laughs> and I did. That was 2019? That's 2019. What month were you? I'm August. The oh, hot. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't pick that, so. <laughs> but then you're also, I mean, the following year, one of you're the first Playmate of the Year. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you could imagine the conversation with my Catholic mother that I'm going to be in Playboy. You didn't send her a copy. <laughs> It's detailed in my book. I'm also like, I'm so, it's childlike, and I played a little trick on her. You want to hear it? Want to hear it? So when we, my sisters knew that you know I did the play, I did Playboy. I was like, you know, I'm just gonna wait till it gets close. You know, I obviously, obviously she can't say anything, but like, let me just, you know, the inner child in me like came back. The like the Catholic guilt. I'm like, oh my God, oh my, my mom will say. And then when we were in San Francisco with my family, and <laughs> so horrible. I, I showed my mom that, mom, I did Playboy, and I promise it's, you know, it's very tasteful, it's very elegant. So online, <laughs> there's all these pictures of Photoshop celebrities with like in lewd positions, <laughs> like lewd positions. And I showed that to her. I was like, you know, see the celebrities did this, you know? <laughs> this is what I did. Literally, my mom was standing, and she started shaking, like turned red, and, and then she had to sit down. And my sister saw that I was doing this, like, "Come on, you have to." That's mean. <laughs> but hilarious. It's hilarious. It was hilarious. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. She loves me. You know, she loves me. She loves the Playboy. She loves me. It was horrible. It's, um, that's how we do it, Filipino. We like we go, like everything is a joke. You know, I think I don't know. I can relate to that. Yeah. Um, I think it's time to. Sign some books, right? You guys, thank you so much for being here. Gina, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. It's my honor. Thank you.